In this video, we combine some of the most disturbing cave diving tragedies we've covered on this channel so far. From divers who got lost in the silt, to divers who made a wrong turn and struggled to find their way out. If you enjoy watching these videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel for more exciting cave diving stories like these. Two brothers went on a deep dive adventure in the El Sacatón sinkhole, located in Mexico. This was in a bid to beat their personal record. However, on the ascent, the BCD of one of the brothers started to inflate on its own, creating an uncontrolled rapid ascent. This leaves them at a risk of nitrogen narcosis, or even a greater risk. In Mexico, there's an incredibly amazing natural wonder, called the El Sacatón sinkhole. It's special because it's the deepest sinkhole filled with water anywhere on Earth. You can find this remarkable hole on El Rancho Azufrosa, not far from the town of Aldama in northeastern Mexico. El Sacatón measures about 328 feet across and goes down more than 339 meters, making it the deepest water-filled sinkhole known to us. Interestingly, the bottom of El Sacatón is located some 426 feet below sea level. These kinds of sinkholes aren't formed by regular groundwater, but by the powerful forces of volcanoes. So it's not just any hole in the ground, it's an extraordinary geological wonder. El Sacatón sinkhole is part of a special place called Sistema Sacatón, a place full of amazing underground features that you won't find anywhere else in the world. In fact, there are about 20 unique features in this area, like sinkholes, caves, and springs. These natural wonders were created by really hot groundwater that comes from deep within the Earth because of volcanic activity. Now, out of all these features, the El Sacatón sinkhole stands out the most. It's not only the deepest of the five unusual sinkholes here, but it's also the most famous. Professional divers got really interested in this incredibly deep hole back in the late 1980s. Since then, El Sacatón has been a big deal in the world of scuba diving. People have even broken some world records for diving here. So this dive location is a place where history is made for divers. Finn & Lewis, 35 years old, was a high school geography teacher who had a store where he sold diving equipment. Finnan and his brother Rex, a soldier, were known in their neighborhood for their love of diving. They started diving in high school after they lost a close family member in the sea. Ever since, the brothers have utilized every opportunity they have had together to explore the underwater world. When Finnan was diagnosed with critically high blood pressure, he was advised to stop diving because it could be fatal. To show support for his brother, Rex also stopped diving with a promise to resume when his brother was physically fit to return to the underwater world. After his blood pressure was declared not critical again, the brothers were eager to return to the sport. Finnan and Rex Lewis decided to beat their personal deep dive record of 180 feet two years later. Diving for them is all about getting better and having fun while at it. So they came to the decision that they would deep dive to 246 feet. Having agreed, they embarked on weeks of physical training. During the training, Finnan appeared to be a little rusty and not well enough for any physical training, especially since he stopped diving for a while due to critically high blood pressure. However, having treated it, he was eager to go back to diving. So they concluded that he would improve his psychology and diet. The brothers made a long list of positive diving affirmations which they listen to before any practice dive. This is to program their minds for confidence and success. Rex also ensured that Finnan drank water mixed with sea salt because of his high blood pressure and his body's inability to retain water. Therefore, this water mixture was to increase his thirst for water, which would in turn make his blood pressure rise. This is critical to avoid a blackout while diving which can be fatal and one of a diver's worst nightmares. They continued their practice dive with their safety divers. 
With time, they got better and more prepared to embark on the record-breaking dive. After a week of intensive training, the day approached, and Rex was supercharged for this feat. However, on the morning of the dive, Finnan had a different feeling. He was overwhelmed with negative emotions, and even told Rex about it. When he mentioned what he was feeling, Rex was worried about him and asked him if he still intended to continue with the dive or if they should schedule it for another day. However, Finnan insisted that they should continue with the plan. He believed it was just one of those feelings one has before achieving a great feat. So the brothers dressed up, packed their dive gear, and drove off to the dive location in their truck. They picked up the two support divers on the way. At the dive site, they unpacked and suited up an hour before the dive. Rex asked his brother if he was still having negative feelings, but Finnan assured him that they had reduced and that he was supercharged for the record-breaking challenge. They synchronized their watches to begin their 50-minute warm-up. Once done, the brothers did a packed stretch, lying on their back, then lubed their monofin foot pocket and got in the water. They swam out to the warm-up line and started a few minutes of facial immersion. After the facial immersion, they did three exhale dives to 20 feet. This is closely followed by another pack stretch. After this, Rex again asked his brother if he was feeling okay, and Finnan gave him a thumbs-up signal, assuring him that he was fine. Then they did a warm-up dive to get their bodies accustomed to the feel of the water. Afterward, they started their warm-up static breath holds until their official countdown began. The brothers took their positions, and they were told it was one minute until my countdown. They swam to the official line, put on their masks, and started breathing face down. Their descent began pretty well, and it was uneventful. They passed their previous record of 180 feet successfully and were headed for 246 feet. Soon they saw the light at the tag about 20 feet away, and Rex was super glad they were about to achieve what they had intensely practiced for. They grabbed their tags and started the ascent. Everything was going well until they got to 75 feet, and Rex saw that Finnan was in danger. His BCD was starting to inflate on its own. This had happened to Rex before, some years ago, when they dived together, but then Finnan came to his aid and quickly disconnected the air hose, and he carried on. This was what Rex expected Finnan to do. However, that didn't happen. Finnan didn't do that. Instead, he was upside down, kicking frantically and trying to stay down. Not long after, Finnan stopped kicking and just shot up to the surface. Rex followed his brother up, but he was mindful of not going up too quickly especially since his dive computer was beeping warnings at him. When he got to the surface, he realized that Finnan had been pulled up and they were performing CPR on him. They informed him that they had called for help already. He panicked and a cold shiver went down his spine. He wondered why he didn't use his dump valve, especially since he was experienced with it and knew exactly what to do. Then he saw that the string he should have pulled to open the valve was missing. That meant that Finnan had no means of dumping the air when it was oriented that way. When a diver ascends, it must not be a rush dive. It must be done slowly because at that depth, the body is under pressure and the individual's blood and tissues can hold more gases dissolved in it than when one is at the surface. But while ascending to the surface, those dissolved gases must return to being gases. Therefore, while on a slow ascent, the diver breathes those gases out. But if the ascent is fast, they will turn into gas bubbles that will be within the arteries and veins before they can be vented out, which can be fatal. This leads to embolisms and decompression sickness. This is why divers have decompression stops and ascend slowly. Unfortunately, before Finnan could be transported to the hospital, he had stopped breathing. When an autopsy was done, they discovered that he panicked and died of low blood pressure. His blood pressure reading was less than 90 over 60, and any diver suffering from this is advised not to participate in diving until the blood pressure has been treated appropriately. Because if it had only been the rapid ascent, he could have been treated in a decompression chamber. 
It's imperative before ever diving to check and ascertain that all diving gear is not faulty, because even a minor fault can be fatal. On Saturday, July 12, 2020, a 49-year-old male American citizen decided to dive into the far reaches of Cenote Vacaja, which is a part of Sistema Zapote, located in Mexico. He was a seasoned cave diver who had done approximately 470 cave dives before this fateful dive. He was quite familiar with Cenote Vacaja, but his fateful dive didn't turn out as planned. Cenote Vacaja is a section of Sistema Zapote in Mexico and is situated four miles from Tulum on Coba Road. This cave has an average depth of about 70 feet, which is for the section that is thought to be deeper. The flow runs in a southeastern direction from Cenote Vacaja toward Cenote Tucaja, and it's mild by Mexican standards. The diver was a male American citizen aged 49. He received his initial training in Mexico and became fully certified as a cave diver in 2007. On numerous future journeys, he continued to train and gain experience. He has certifications for using numerous extra tank stages, DPVs, and advanced side mount diving, which uses specially built underwater scooters. After receiving his initial certification, he frequently visited Mexico. In 2019, he retired from his professional career and moved to Tulum. At the time of this dive, he had made about 470 cave dives. He had been resurveying, investigating, and then drawing line maps of the caves ever since relocating to Tulum. He created numerous line maps and projects, and he was a highly active cave diver. On Sunday, July 12, 2020, at about 9.30 a.m., this eager diver dove into Cenote Vacaja. The diver had resurveyed all of the existing lines to create a line map of the system, so he was well familiar with the cave and its surroundings. Additionally, he expanded his research and expanded the system with new lines. Since he had visited the dive site so regularly over the previous months, the property caretaker knew him well. He dove in, but he failed to emerge. This was unusual, and when the caretaker expected him to exit, but he didn't, he became anxious. After a considerable amount of time, he informed the diving center that the diver had failed to exit, and the diving center alerted the search and recovery team. The search team included divers Patrick Widman, Rob Bartlett, and Skanda Cofield. They gathered at ProTech Dive Center around 7.30 p.m. after receiving the call. The victim was rumored to have intended to dive to the far reaches, therefore the search crew prepared rebreathers and DPVs. This was the best choice because no one was certain of the diver's route and depth. Robbie Schmidtner and Kent Stone arrived at Cenote Vacaja at 9.30 p.m., just as the search crew was getting ready. They had conducted a land search while scouting for Cenote Tucaja, another system-connected entry. The team decided they were potentially looking for a drowned diver because there was no evidence of the missing diver and no other known exits. The search crew intended to dive using side-mounted closed-circuit rebreathers for a maximum of four hours, bringing two side-mount tanks, a third tank for a bailout, and a DPV with oxygen for each diver to drop at 20 feet. The strategy was to first proceed to Cenote Tucaja, and if the missing diver was not located, to then continue through the Enormo land area to search for clues. At 2 a.m., they descended, deposited the gas, and verified that the diver's oxygen gas tank was still connected to the line and operational. After reassembling, the crew entered the cave. The diver's route was assumed to have led to the location where they suspected he may be found at the first jump left, which was located around 300 feet into the cave. The team fixed a jump and continued even though a jump spool wasn't present. Skanda trailed behind Patrick and Rob, who were in the lead. Due to the low, silty bedding plane in this area of the cave, which has a low floor-to-ceiling height and very fine sediment on the floor, silt disturbance increased significantly and visibility decreased. A barrier 700 feet from the entry was where the team found the diver, who showed no signs of life. 
The diver was discovered on the cave side of the restriction. To cross, a diver carrying three tanks would have to discard at least one of them. All three of the diver's tanks were discovered in his possession, and the DPV was still fastened to him. There was no indication of anxiety or agitation. A diver would need about 12 to 15 minutes to swim the distance from the entrance. The search crew left from Cenote Vakaha to notify the local authorities and to begin arrangements for the body's recovery after having verified the demise and whereabouts of the missing diver. The search team's dives lasted a total of 40 minutes. The next morning was designated for the body's recovery, and a group of three divers, Rob Bartlett, Patrick Widman, and Kim Davidson, went underwater to collect data. With less than an hour of dive time, recovery was accomplished. Officials from the police, the coroner's office, and civil protection were there in addition to the recovery crew. Skanda and another diver had to do a third dive to find the diver's remaining equipment items because of the silty conditions, which resulted in zero visibility during the retrieval. Following the equipment retrieval, a dive accident analysis was carried out to determine what went wrong. According to a forensic analysis of the equipment, there were no failures or obvious causes for the disaster. After the accident, tests revealed that all regulators, valves, and tanks were in good working condition. The tanks had no liquid in them. The Seacraft DPV was completely operational and had a battery life of 73%. The victim dove into the cave with equipment that was adequate, including all required safety gear. The diver was found to be using side-mounted cylinders along with a second stage tank that was filled with 32% nitrox and a deco tank of oxygen that was left at the entry. He dived in Cenote Vakaha while using a DPV for speed. The diver made the initial jump to the left without installing a spool. There were no remaining spools, signs, or means of navigation. Later dives into the area were performed to confirm this. However, survey information from the diver's MNEMO survey instrument matched up with the lines of a newly surveyed region. The diver investigated three different lines totaling 900 feet on the day of the disaster. The diver either personally examined these lines or they were resurveyed, or both. Although it's unclear how far the victim advanced inside the cave, he did not proceed past the jump to Enormo land because the area is shallow, reaching up to 20 feet. By looking up the victim's profile in the dive computer's record, this was verified. Further examination of the diver's computer revealed that the greatest depth was 78 feet, and the average depth was 60 feet, and the total dive time was 160 minutes until the diver's gas ran out. In summary, solo cave diving is a heavily debated subject. It means not having a companion or backup brain to support you in an emergency or difficulty. Also, this is diving without getting a second or third opinion during the dive's preparation or implementation. But locals frequently do so, particularly when navigating tiny cave channels. It is possible to question if solo cave diving enhances or lessens dangers given the particular type of cave. Who knows with certainty what transpired during the dive? All the details we knew for sure were the victim's starting point, the finishing point, maximum depth, average depth, and the moment the victim ran out of gas. We have a general idea of the diver's location and path. What specifically occurred during the victim's final dive? One may only offer conjecture and draw logical conclusions. Most likely, a factor was becoming incredibly comfortable in an atmosphere that is often highly uncomfortable and harsh. Other potential contributing variables included solo diving, intricate navigation, exploration, the use of a DPV, recalculating gas ranges, and penetration. However, as was already said, this is at best an assumption. What we do know is that scuba diving with a restricted gas supply in water-filled tunnels may be a very harsh and hazardous activity. The diver can make one deadly error or numerous lesser ones.
Deep within the Mayan jungles beyond the town of Tulum, Mexico, lies a dense green forest that opens up to reveal a remarkable sight. A circular hole measuring about 200 feet in diameter, and its depth almost matches its width. Locally known as a cenote, this sinkhole harbors one of the most captivating dive spots in the entire world. Its name is Angelita, and it has an enchanting quality that brings about feelings of mystery and a touch of spookiness. However, exploring this cave is no easy feat. At first, as you descend, the water appears crystal clear, offering visibility up to 65 feet below. But as you go deeper, the water turns increasingly murky, making the surroundings feel like an underworld. The dive takes you as far down as 200 feet beneath the water surface, making it a dive reserved only for the most seasoned and experienced divers. The Cenote Angelita River, right within this sinkhole, is a fascinating marvel in itself. It features various unique layers where freshwater and saltwater come together alternating in distinct patterns. The river looks even more beautiful because of the colorful leaves and branches from nearby trees. These tree parts float along the river's edges because the water is thick. The most incredible thing about this river is a thick cloud of hydrogen sulfide that is about four and a half feet wide and stretches around 98 feet. The gases gather where fresh water and salt water meet, creating a false bottom at the river's bottom. You can cross this false bottom and reach a dark and otherworldly chamber filled with jungle debris. The base of this debris mountain starts below the cloud, but reaches above it. When you rise from below the cloud, you'll see the peak of the debris mountain take on a new appearance, like you're climbing a mountain covered with clouds. It's like being in a magical place, unlike anything else you've experienced. Lucia Russell grew up as an inquisitive child, she was always on the hunt for the next new adventure, and at age 9, she was known to be an amazing swimmer. At 19, after seeing a cave diving show, she developed her skills and devoted her time to becoming a cave diver. After registering for training, she met Ricardo Felipe, and they became best friends. They were both in the same diving class and got certified together. After being certified, they made a bucket list of caves they would explore together. Since then, they have been diving buddies, exploring the different dive sites in Mexico, including Cenote El Pete, Cenote Dos Hoyos, and Gran Cenote. Lucia and Ricardo had Cenote Angelita next on their list of places to explore. They were excited to witness the famous thick hydrogen sulfide cloud at a depth of 98 feet. They got ready for their dive, and the much-anticipated day finally came. After a short walk through the jungle from the car park, they arrived at a large lake. Before taking the plunge, they put on all their diving equipment on the simple benches provided in the jungle. Fully geared up, they began their journey down the dirt trail leading to the cenote. When they reached the cenote's edge, they took a bold leap off the simple wooden dock propelling themselves into the mysterious depths of the Mayan underworld. The adventure had just begun, and they were eager to explore the wonders that lay ahead. As they began their descent into the cenote, the water appeared hazy for the first 32 to 49 feet. The haziness was due to the organic material falling from the lush surroundings of the cenote. It felt eerie right from the start, making them understand the belief held by the ancient Mayans the cenotes were entrances to the underworld. As they delved deeper into the cenote, the haze gradually cleared, revealing at a distance the mesmerizing spectacle the cenote Angelita is known for, the famous hydrogen sulfide lair, the site they are headed for. As they continued their descent, Lucia and Ricardo finally reached a depth of 98 feet, right in the magical cloud. They were amazed by the extraordinary sight, something they could never have imagined. Truly, there was nothing else quite like it anywhere in the world. This unique cloud was no ordinary gas. It was a dense and thick hydrogen sulfide cloud suspended in Cenote Angelita. The origin of this remarkable cloud became clear to them. It formed from plant materials falling into the cenote and breaking down, releasing hydrogen sulfide gas. 
This was unlike other cenotes they had seen before, such as El Pete, where only a thin cloud exists. But here in Cenote Angelita, the cloud took on a denser and more substantial form. They noticed rocks and rubble emerging from the cloud, forming what seemed like a mountain or mound in the cenote. This mound is called a talus cone, a fancy term for a debris mound. It was a remnant of the collapsed cenote's covering, adding to the intriguing beauty of this underwater wonderland. Lucia and Ricardo began exploring this mysterious site. Apart from its creepy appearance, the hydrogen sulfide is also known to have a pungent and sulfurous smell much like rotten eggs. However, since they were breathing compressed air from their dive tanks, it was safe for them to dive in and around the hydrogen sulfide. Under this thick cloud, the light was almost entirely blocked, causing the surroundings to be nearly pitch black. It was due to this darkness that Lucia and Ricardo decided to limit their dive depths to just 98 feet, which was the general depth for most dives. Beyond this point, it's a dangerous dive site suitable for more advanced divers. Those who want to dive below the cloud must ensure their dive light is switched on to help them navigate through the darkness. Additionally, they must keep a close eye on their depths to ensure a safe and controlled exploration. After an amazing time of exploration, the two divers signaled to each other that it was time to start their ascent. With another dive site successfully completed, they felt a sense of accomplishment. As they ascended, they were set to follow the proper diving procedures to ensure their safety. They would do the following. At around 49 feet, they would pause for a deep stop, allowing their bodies to adjust to the changing pressure. This stop would last for about two and a half minutes, ensuring that they minimized the risk of decompression sickness. They would then continue their ascent until they gradually reached a depth of 15 to 20 feet, where they would perform their final safety stop. During this three to five minute stop, they would stay at this depth to release any remaining nitrogen from their bodies, reducing the risk of decompression-related issues even further. With this in mind, they began their slow ascent toward the surface. During their ascent, Lucia and Ricardo encountered a distressing situation when they reached the 50-foot deep stop. Suddenly, Lucia signaled to Ricardo that something was wrong and urgently reached for her bailout regulator. It was clear that she was in trouble. In a state of panic, Ricardo saw Lucia experiencing what seemed like a seizure, and she even spat out her regulator. Without hesitation, Ricardo made an emergency ascent, bringing Lucia with him. Throughout the ascent, he couldn't help but fear that she might also be suffering from an arterial gas embolism, a potentially serious condition caused by air bubbles entering the bloodstream during rapid ascents. Once they reached the surface, Ricardo came across other divers nearby. Together, they immediately started performing CPR on Lucia, trying to revive her before the ambulance they had called arrived. Despite their efforts, Lucia remained unconscious. The situation was tense and worrisome. They carried Lucia to the car park where they could provide her with comfort while waiting for the medical personnel to assess her condition. It was a difficult and distressing moment for everyone involved, who were hoping and praying for Lucia's recovery. As they awaited the arrival of the ambulance, Ricardo couldn't help but replay the events in his mind, trying to understand what had gone wrong. The dive that had started with so much excitement and anticipation had taken an unexpectedly dark turn. He hoped for a miracle. Eventually, after 25 minutes, the ambulance finally arrived at the scene. Lucia was carefully taken to the hospital, where medical professionals immediately attended to her. Upon evaluation, it was revealed that Lucia had suffered an anoxic brain injury which occurred due to the delay between her spitting out the regulator and the start of CPR. The precious moments that passed before Ricardo and the other divers could provide life-saving assistance had severe consequences. At the hospital, the medical team conducted thorough examinations, including an electroencephalogram, or EEG. This test confirmed that Lucia had experienced a series of epileptic seizures, these seizures were possibly a result of oxygen toxicity, a condition that can occur when a diver breathes high concentrations of oxygen during their dive. 
Despite the dedicated efforts of the medical staff and the support of her loved ones, Lucia's condition remained critical. The entire ordeal was unbearable for everyone involved. Ricardo, her family and friends hoped and prayed for her recovery as they waited for any signs of improvement. However, despite the best medical care, Lucia's condition continued to deteriorate. Tragically, four days later, Lucia passed away. Her departure left a void in the hearts of those who knew and loved her. Her untimely passing was mourned by divers far and wide. Two divers, a Dane and an Italian, set out to find an 8,000-year-old human skeleton located deep within the unmapped underwater caves in the Mexican jungle. This exploration, filled with many dangers, was not for the faint-hearted, but their discovery can be truly life-changing. The Yucatan Peninsula, located in the southeast part of Mexico and encompassing parts of Belize and Guatemala, is an extensive piece of land that stretches toward the northeast. It acts as a natural divider between the Gulf of Mexico on its northern and western sides and the Caribbean Sea to the east. Connecting these two bodies of water is the Yucatan Channel, located between the peninsula's northeastern tip and Cuba. In terms of its dimensions, the peninsula boasts an average width of approximately 200 miles and a coastline spanning roughly 700 miles. The Yucatan Peninsula is a flat area made of limestone, and it doesn't have rivers that you can see on the surface. Instead, all the rivers with fresh water are hidden underneath the ground. Because the limestone can absorb water, it creates spaces like caverns and caves where this fresh water gathers. This is why you find cenotes, which are like holes filled with water. Mexico has around 6,000 cenotes, and most of them are in the Yucatan Peninsula. Some of the noteworthy ones are in Tulum, Cancun, and Merida. Additionally, there's a significant cenote called El Zacatón in Chiapas State, which is one of the biggest freshwater sinkholes in Mexico. Born in 1974 in Copenhagen, Denmark, Klaus Tymon is a versatile individual who has carried out exploration, science, and creativity. Currently residing in London, United Kingdom, he holds the titles of Danish explorer, scientist, fellow at the Royal Geographical Society, photographer, filmmaker, and creative director. At the age of 14 in 1988, Klaus embarked on his photography journey initially capturing images of tourists on canal tours. Over the subsequent years, he contributed as a photographer and writer to various Danish publications. Klaus earned recognition in 1996 by receiving the Scandinavian Kodak Gold Award. Throughout his dynamic career as a journalist, photographer, and explorer, Klaus has undertaken diverse expeditions. These include venturing into the jungles of Uganda and Congo, by pioneering new routes and being the first to scuba dive in New Zealand's Blue Lake, renowned as the world's clearest lake. Despite having engaged in cave diving for less than a decade, Klaus has been a lifelong diver. It was in Mexico that Klaus had the chance to meet Alessandro Riato, an Italian cave diver and former army map maker nicknamed Alex. Their friendship blossomed in 2016 through mutual connections. Alex's diving journey began in 1993, and he became a potty open water instructor in 1997. Over the years, he shared his expertise as a diving instructor in various locations, including Italy, Mexico, Zanzibar, the Bahamas, the Dominican Republic, Egypt, and the Maldives, amassing a wealth of experience with thousands of dives. Alex's introduction to caves happened in 1998, and by 2002, he officially became a cave diver in the caves of Mexico. Since 2005, Alex has called Mexico home. With Alex, Klaus feels like he has found a partner in their shared pursuit of adventure, a companion with whom he can navigate the uncharted territories of nature. When Alex told Klaus about finding an ancient prehistoric skeleton in unexplored underwater caves deep in the Mexican jungle, Klaus eagerly joined the adventure. By estimating the bones to be over 9,000 years old through calculations based on historic water levels, 
they could potentially be among the oldest discovered in the country. This sparked a race to document the discovery, gather a sample for analysis, and ensure official protection from looters who often target such sites. To prepare for the expedition, Klaus abstains from drinking for at least a week before diving, maintains a daily exercise routine, and follows a healthy diet, recognizing that excess weight hinders the ability to navigate through confined spaces. The long-awaited exploration day finally arrived. Klaus, Alex, and their guide, Jesus, started their journey into the jungle. Jesus, armed with his machete, led the way in front of the 4x4, cutting through vegetation. As they progressed, the road and jungle blended, prompting them to leave the vehicle and continue on foot. Their destination? The cenote, which the GPS coordinates pointed to, which is a sinkhole that serves as their gateway to the underwater river system. This particular cenote is not visible from the air due to its depth within the cave, but ongoing exploration constantly reveals new cenotes and more cave systems in the area. Upon reaching their destination and all set to go, they conducted final equipment checks on the surface and reviewed their plan once more. Discussing navigation, the goal was to reach the ancient bones to capture photos for analysis and images that would later be used to create a 3D model. Each had a specific role assigned. Klaus and Alex, equipped with Alex's camera, entered the cave's water, which appeared yellow near the surface due to tannic acid from recent rainfall. Alex carefully monitored the underwater housing for any signs of leakage. Illuminating their path was a video light and a light on Alex's helmet. This dive was an extremely challenging form of cave exploration. It could be more accurately described as cave exploration rather than diving, as most of the routes they were surveying hadn't been mapped before. This would make Klaus and Alex the first humans in modern history to lay eyes on whatever awaited them around the next dark corner. Alex was leading and Klaus was documenting and preparing the materials necessary for archaeologists and scientists. Their approach had a methodical structure. They followed an established line, and after roughly 30 minutes, Alex added an exploration reel to the existing line. Klaus captured photographs of the locations where they secured the line to create a visual record. Typically, a marker like an arrow could be left on the line, but they didn't do that due to the risk of looting and potential damage to the site. To safeguard their findings, they kept everything confidential, even removing the lines each time they visited the site. This secrecy was essential in protecting the archaeological treasure from unauthorized access or harm. After swimming for a long distance inside the cave, they eventually reached a section of the cave they hadn't seen before. They found themselves 984 feet inside, with a dense jungle above them just 32.8 feet away. This area revealed the purpose of their mission the ancient bones from prehistoric times. Right at the moment they arrived at the bones, the part of Klaus's breathing apparatus in his mouth, called the mouthpiece, suddenly broke. The rubber that was holding it together with his teeth came apart in several pieces, causing both a loss of airflow and a bit of water seepage. Without delay, Klaus switched to his alternative air supply, assessed the damage, and determined that he could continue the dive. He adapted by holding the broken mouthpiece in a different way with his teeth. He remained confident that everything was okay because he had a spare mouthpiece in his dive pouch. If necessary, he could replace it underwater. Klaus saw this equipment malfunction as a minor issue that didn't warrant aborting the mission. Navigating through a narrow passageway, barely larger than Klaus himself, measuring around 60 centimeters from floor to ceiling, proved to be a challenging feat. Klaus cautiously began capturing images of the prehistoric human bones in this tight space. This confined area allowed only a minimal distance, less than the span of an elbow, between the dome of Klaus's underwater camera housing and scattered skull parts, including loose teeth hidden beneath fine-grained silt. Making any wrong move at this delicate archaeological site could disturb it and lead to damage. Moreover, a slight mishap could stir up a cloud of silt, resulting in zero visibility, a highly undesirable situation. 
The space was so cramped that swimming was impossible for Klaus. Instead, he had to assume a plank position, stretching out his body, arms, and legs. This dive presented the most stress Klaus had ever experienced. He understood that maintaining calmness was crucial. Otherwise, he risked depleting his air supply too quickly, with a high chance of drowning. Alex positioned Klaus by holding on to his ankles and skillfully guiding him through the underwater space. Using hand signals, Klaus communicated his movements by pointing his index finger forward, and Alex responded by gently pushing him in that direction. While attempting to maintain a yoga-like position specific to cave diving, Klaus encountered an obstacle when Alex accidentally bumped into the top of his leg. Fortunately, they had practiced for such situations, and Klaus knew exactly what to do. He released a small amount of air from his lungs, causing him to descend about five centimeters. This subtle adjustment was just enough to avoid colliding with a low-hanging part of the cave roof. In this challenging environment, every slight movement posed its own set of challenges and required a careful approach to ensure safety and navigation. They advanced through the underwater space by moving a few centimeters at a time, carefully documenting every detail as if following an invisible grid. Klaus maintained a vigilant check on his pressure gauges, ensuring that he didn't use too much air and had sufficient supply to safely exit the cave. The entire operation unfolded over 70 minutes, during which Klaus captured approximately 500 images of the skull area. These images would later contribute to the completion of a photogrammetry model, allowing scientists to explore the cave virtually on a computer screen. Simultaneously, Alex undertook his own task by laying down a new navigational line. Using his exploration reel, he marked uncharted territory in the cave and secured the line to a stalagmite. This additional step ensured that their exploration efforts were not only visually documented, but also supported with a reliable guide for future expeditions in this previously unexplored cave. Various signs pointed to the likelihood that the skeleton they discovered was from a prehistoric era. This conclusion was drawn by considering both historical water levels and the current depth of the water. When these two measurements are combined, a more realistic understanding emerges. The remains were located approximately 984 feet away from the nearest upstream opening, submerged at a depth of 32.8 feet. This positioning suggests that the body couldn't have drifted there with the current. Moreover, the last time the water depth at this location was as low as 32.8 feet dates back to about 8,000 to 10,000 years ago. This circumstance potentially makes these bones among the oldest human remains ever unearthed in Mexico, contingent upon the precise dating process. While calculations based on water levels offer an estimate of the youngest possible age of the bones, it's important to note that these remains could have been in place for a significant period even before the rise in water levels occurred. The exact dating process will play a crucial role in determining the true age and historical significance of these ancient human remains. After completing this mission, they dived out of this ancient site. What they had accomplished ensured that they could file permits with the Mexican authorities. These permits will authorize them to get a sample for analysis. The analysis of the DNA sample holds the potential to unveil the connections between our ancestors and Native Americans and also reveal the hidden archaeological value embedded within these river systems. Two friends went on an exploratory dive at Cenote Calavera, the Temple of Doom. They planned to stay within the daylight reflection of the cave until one of the friends got the urge to explore a dark and tight passageway and got stuck. Would he make it out alive? The Temple of Doom, also known as Cenote Calavera, which means Skull Cave in Spanish, is located near Tulum on Mexico's Mayan Riviera. It's the first cenote you'll encounter when traveling on Cobra Road, just five minutes from Tulum. The name of this cenote is related to its three round openings on the cave ceiling, which resemble the eyes and mouth of a skull when seen from above. Although it may seem small at first glance, the cenote widens as you go deeper below the surface. 
Exploring this cenote involves diving in a series of loops around the main area and gradually ascending with each loop. What makes this cenote unique is that it's filled with halocline water because it's near the ocean, which is a combination of freshwater and saltwater. Unlike other cenotes, where these waters mix to create a mildly salty pool, in Cenote Calavera, they form distinct layers that sit on top of each other. This creates a fascinating visual effect. When you visit the cenote, you'll be greeted by a large canyon that's filled with numerous passageways and caverns to explore. The cenote maintains an average annual temperature of about 77 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius, providing a comfortable environment for visitors. It has a depth of approximately 53 feet, and for your safety, there's a permanent guideline that you must follow at all times while diving or swimming. As you venture into the cenote, you'll come across a cavern adorned with stunning rock formations. What truly captivates visitors is the way the beautiful natural light streams through the small entrances above, casting enchanting patterns that resemble a skull when viewed from below. It's a sight that will leave you in awe. To immerse yourself in the refreshing waters of Cenote Calavera, you'll walk along a path that spans about 200 feet. Once you reach the designated spot, you can take a jump from a height of 8 feet into the water. For your convenience, there are sturdy wooden stairs available to ensure a safe exit from the cenote after you've finished your exploration. Abram Major worked as a teacher in a high school in Mexico. During his time in high school, he excelled in swimming and discovered a deep passion for diving while he was in college. Once he completed his studies, Abram pursued a teaching career where he found joy in educating young minds. Little did he know that his love for diving would soon intertwine with his professional life. One day, while on a diving excursion, Abram had the opportunity to meet Diego, a fellow diver. To their surprise, they discovered that they both resided in the same neighborhood. This unexpected connection sparked a special bond between them, and they quickly became dive buddies. Their shared love for exploring the depths of the underwater world created a strong friendship that extended beyond their diving adventures. Abram Major and his dive buddy Diego made thorough preparations for their upcoming dive at Cenote Calavera, their next diving location. They planned to embark on the Loop Dive, a thrilling underwater adventure that they had been eagerly anticipating. Aware of the potential dangers within the underwater cave system, they both agreed to remain within the areas illuminated by daylight. The cave system posed a risk of getting lost or disoriented in the darkness, making it a place that required utmost caution. Undertaking this diving trip required courage and a strong spirit, as the journey they were about to embark on was not for the faint of heart. It all began with a lengthy walk of about 200 feet leading them to the entrance of the cenote. They arrived at the site at precisely 11.30 a.m. Abram and Diego prepared to take a daring leap from an eight-foot ledge, plunging into the mouth of the skull-shaped opening. As they entered the crystal-clear waters of Cenote Calavera, the divers were greeted by the beautiful effects of the sun's rays penetrating through the small entrances above, creating a mesmerizing display of light beneath the surface. After entering, they discovered themselves surrounded by greenish fresh water and started going deeper into the darkness. While descending, they noticed a guideline that would lead them to the beginning of the permanent cavern line, located 20 feet below. At first, they encountered a talus cone, which is a term used in cave and cavern diving to describe a heap of debris often found near entrances. They followed a guideline that guided them further down the side of the talus cone. This guideline led them through a halocline at a depth of 33 feet, where they transitioned from fresh water to warmer salt water below. Eventually, it brought them to the cavern, located at a depth of 52 feet. This enormous hollow space has an average diameter of more than 165 feet. Typically, they want to explore the cenote by following a series of loops along the main perimeter, starting at the deepest level of 52 feet, which is where they are. So they gradually started ascending with each loop. While making their way up the loop, Diego led the way while his friend followed. Abram became captivated by the remarkably intricate caves and narrow corridors, 
momentarily forgetting to stick to the well-lit areas. As his friend ascended, curiosity got the better of him, and he ventured into one of the passageways to satisfy his sense of exploration. As he moved away from the illuminated portion, the surroundings gradually grew darker. Nevertheless, he pressed on and soon found himself entering a larger section, which he eagerly explored using his dive torch for light. After realizing that his friend might be concerned about his whereabouts, Abram decided to retrace his steps and return to the designated path. Spotting another passageway, he noticed a glimmer of light in the distance. Although this passageway seemed narrower, he paid it little mind as he could see the reflection of light ahead. With hopes of swiftly finding his way back to the correct path, Abram ventured into the passageway, but soon he became aware that it was gradually becoming narrower. He proceeded cautiously, inching his way forward head first, utilizing his hips, stomach, and fingers to navigate through the constricted passage. Unfortunately, within a matter of minutes, a realization dawned upon him. A dire mistake had been made. Abram was now trapped with barely any room to turn around, let alone wriggle back the way he came. His only option was to press forward. Desperate to make progress, he attempted to squeeze through a tiny space. However, Abram found himself firmly wedged in place, unable to move any further. As Diego neared the surface, he became aware that Abram was nowhere in sight. Confusion and concern gripped his mind. What could have transpired? Did Abram venture ahead without him? Determined to find answers, Diego proceeded with his ascent, hoping to locate his missing companion. However, as he reached the surface, Abram was still nowhere to be found. Panic consumed Diego, and without hesitation, he plunged back into the water, desperately hoping to encounter Abram along the way. Thankfully, he had sufficient air supply for an unplanned dive. With a sense of urgency, Diego scanned the surrounding area scouring every nook and cranny for any possible indication of Abram's presence. But to his dismay, he didn't come across any trace of his dear friend. Continuing along the series of loops, Diego reached the point where he discovered a disturbed and murky passageway, the very same one that Abram had entered earlier. His heart raced with worry, but as he illuminated the path with his torch, he struggled to see what lay ahead. Amidst his contemplation, he noticed a faint ray of light emanating from one of the adjacent passageways, which caught his attention. Intrigued, he decided to investigate its source. With cautious steps, Diego ventured into the darkness, but soon realized he couldn't proceed any further due to the narrowness of the passage. However, within his limited field of vision, he spotted Abram a few feet away, hopelessly trapped in the tight confines of the passageway. Diego's heart sank at the sight. Abram's arms were wedged beneath his chest, rendering him immobile and helpless. Despite his desire to assist his friend, Diego acknowledged that he alone couldn't provide the necessary aid. Reluctantly, he made the difficult decision to leave Abram behind and rush to seek help. Diego frantically scrambled toward the cave's exit, determined to find assistance as quickly as possible. Fortunately, Diego came across a group of skilled and experienced divers who promptly agreed to accompany him. With their guidance, they swiftly reached the spot where Abram remained trapped, his air supply dwindling rapidly. One of the divers bravely entered the constricted passageway, only to realize they would be unable to reach Abram without widening the passage. After carefully evaluating this situation, the divers concluded that a specialized rescue team and specialized equipment were essential to extricate him safely. Regrettably, they had no choice but to leave Abram behind, alone in the darkness, while they sought the necessary assistance. The situation weighed heavily on their hearts as they departed, knowing that time was of the essence to secure the required resources for Abram's rescue. Upon reaching the surface, they immediately contacted the authorities and provided a detailed account of the unfortunate situation. However, due to logistical constraints, the authorities could only assemble a rescue team and gather the necessary equipment by the following day. The prospect of rescuing Abram alive seemed bleak, casting a shadow of despair over Diego's heart. 
Determined not to abandon his friend in his time of need, Diego made the difficult decision to camp near the cave that night, refusing to leave Abram's side. With a heavy heart, Diego reached out to Abram's father, sharing the devastating news of his son's predicament. The next day, at the break of dawn, the long-awaited rescue team arrived at the cave. Equipped with drills and ropes, they began the process of widening the passageway. However, on getting to where Abram was, he was no longer alive. He had tragically passed right there. The rescue team worked for 10 hours to retrieve Abram's lifeless body. They finally succeeded in extricating him from the passageway. A heavy atmosphere of grief and loss filled the air as friends, family, and rescuers joined together to honor the memory of Abram, a young soul whose life was cut tragically short. This was the 12th cave diving marathon on this channel. Let us know what you think in the comments section. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.